So just quickly, we're going to do this next session as uh, additional updates ongoing to talk about platform updates since the last year, covering uh, versions 233 and 235 uh, through 235. Um, this will have a little bit more of a deep dive on some of the tracker things that uh, Lars mentioned, and then we'll uh, turn time over to Marta to talk us through the Android changes. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to focus on, though, was to talk a little bit about growth. So Tracker, uh, as many of you know, is the newer uh, part of DHS2. And it's been our intention and vision all along to be able to help push individual level data collection uh, down uh, as far as possible um, to better serve a lot of the health needs and decision making that we have. And we've had tremendous growth in just the last couple of years uh, at trying to achieve this. So at this point, as far as we know, and again, we don't have uh, clear analytics to everybody who downloads or uses DHS2, but we did a survey back in May where we reached out to all of those that we knew of and were able to update our usage map to 77 countries that are using DHS2 tracker, representing over 120,000 end users, um, meaning that we've had really quite significant growth. If you, if you don't see your country represented on this map, please let us know because we would like to know a little bit more about where tracker is being used and how. I did want to highlight that this means that from 2019 to 2020, the time period that we're reporting on, we've had about 62% growth in terms of uh, uptake and usage. Uh, the most common use cases that we're talking about or that we're seeing the most are disease surveillance, client level health records, which often feed into shared health records, uh, particularly covering ANC, HIV, TB, malaria, immunization. Um, public health event notifications, uh, birth notifications, death notifications, um, a whole host of projects around malaria elimination, which uh, if you remember from the previous conference, we showed a lot of uh, functionality that was meant to support uh, disease elimination uh, in general and malaria elimination in specific and disease registers. Um, this represents uh, not only a lot of users, but a lot of uh, demand, a lot of interest, a lot of, uh, a lot of new functionality being requested all of the time. And about a year ago, we took the determination to try to slow down a little bit on functional requests. We had at that point a, a core suite of uh, functionality that supported the majority of these use cases. And we wanted to let it grow a little bit more, more organically. We wanted to learn from existing projects what they needed, not potential projects. We also wanted to make sure that Tracker was well suited to support really large scale implementations, which is where we have seen this go in the last year, two years. Uh, that countries that are using Tracker end up using it a lot. Um, you'll hear from at least one of those uh, in the next session where we talk about country use stories. We'll hear from Ghana, who is using uh, tracker, tracker very extensively at the health service delivery level, covering a whole number of projects. But what this meant for us is that our priorities during this time frame really heavily focused on this top priority, stability and performance as well as privacy and security and usability. So knowing that we had a lot of users that were out there depending on this software and individual level data software is often transactional. It's something that needs to be updated immediately. It's, the, it's a very different scenario when your system goes down and you have 5,000 nurses around the country depending on that system versus when you have your aggregate system that goes down but reporting doesn't happen for another two weeks so you have you know, time to figure it out. So we've really spent a lot of time and effort on stability and performance. Um, we've always been interested in privacy and security and have added quite a number of features related to that. And then again, in terms of usability, we want the, the features that are present in Tracker to make life easier for the people that are using it. In fact, we have as a whole philosophy, the intention not to do a lot of double data entry, but rather to make this be a tool that people are actually able to use during their normal workflow and it can be something that can feed into aggregate and HMIS instances, but doesn't have to be an additional burden on them. So I'm going to talk through a little bit of what we've done in support of these goals. Uh, the first one is not software. It's actually a new tracker implementation guide. Um, I've put the link here in this slide. Again, these slides are all going to be available in the session uh, that you see on Sketch. 
But uh, this is right there on our docs.dhs2.org, the implementation guide. And this implementation guide is very much focused on all of the considerations about why and when to use Tracker. What are the appropriate kind of use cases? What kind of preconditions should be met? What's likely to lead to success? What are kind of the key challenges you need to be prepared for? So it is not a, a software guide so much as it is, it's a guide that is there for those of you that are managing programs, that are setting up new projects, that are determining what funding should be for an individual implementation, have a better sense about what it takes, how to succeed, um, and what to be prepared for. It includes a number of write-ups of example use cases from real countries. Uh, there will be more work going into this implementation guide that will focus on configuration of Tracker. Uh, but at the moment, that's not what is in the tracker implementation guide. This is very much for implementers and for those kinds of planning determinations that they need to make. Um, we would love to get your feedback on this. Um, it's very easy to make recommended changes to our documentation. That's also uh, open and crowdsourced. And so we would be very happy to have people put more eyes on this and give us some more feedback to make a better tool for everybody in the community. Uh, building off of the publication of that implementation guide, we launched a new Tracker Implementation Academy, a level two academy. The very first live version of this was in Accra in the spring. Um, it was a six day academy covering all of the topics that were found in the implementation guide. You can see listed in bullet points here at the bottom, the, the different topics that we covered. And we had really great participation. There was uh, something like 20 different countries represented there, all Tracker users already, but that were coming to uh, improve their own uh, implementations and also to be able to learn more from each other and from those of us that are working on Tracker in Oslo. Uh, the Implementation Academy had to get cut short because that happened to be right at the moment when COVID really hit in Europe and uh, things started getting closed down. So we had to end this two days early, but the materials are all available. I've linked to those as well as to the community of practice discussion that was around that academy. There's a lot of rich information there for, for those of you that uh, want to know better how to manage or handle or plan for an upcoming tracker implementation. I won't go into all of the details here about tracker performance. A lot of this is kind of under the hood and you know not uh, very easy to understand changes. But I wanted to, to make it clear that we had spent a lot of the developer time that we have focused on optimization, on bugs, on new kinds of architecture. Lars went through some of that in his presentation. A lot of what he talked about just generally as platform improvements also were driven kind of by this need within Tracker for Tracker to perform better, to be quicker at syncing, to produce search results more quickly, to be able to handle the kinds of analytics that are being requested. Um, when a tracker implementation uh, is rolled out in a country, they can quickly triple, quadruple, quintuple their data size um, and what uh, the number of users that they have. So there's a lot here that we really have done to try to make this better. Um, one thing that Lars mentioned in his, I wanted to, to, to hit it one more time, just to say that based on a lot of the rewrites and changes that we've made at this point, we think that tracker is about three times faster and handles concurrency a lot better. What this should mean for those of you that are still on 229, 230, uh, 231 versions of Tracker, really it's worth considering an upgrade. You, you want to have the, the best when it comes to Tracker performance and stability. Um, and uh, some of the changes that Lars has talked about, uh, you know, should make it a little bit easier to set up your new Tracker and to do these upgrades. But if you are running a very large implementation of Tracker and uh, you know, have questions about how to do an upgrade, please you know, post those in the community of practice. Let us uh, try to provide some guidance. I, I won't spend too much time on this. Lars also mentioned this, but I wanted to point out that one of the reasons that we were able to develop this application monitoring and we really saw it as a priority was coming from our real experience supporting several key Tracker implementations. Um, from the University of Oslo, as you know, we don't get involved with every implementation of software, but we have identified some key implementations that were learning projects for us. We spent a lot of time working with uh, Ghana, with Rwanda, with Botswana, with others, and trying to understand what the needs are for their systems and identifying what would be the kinds of tools that would help them out. Um, as, as Lars said, these, we built these application monitoring tools on top of free open applications. Um, these are the kinds of things that really when you're rolling out Tracker, you would want to have a team that is responsible for monitoring the, the, 
uh, the uptime and how things are performing within your tracker implementation and be on top of changes as they happen or any problems that come up very quickly. We have a lot more information there in the sysadmin docs and so we'd, we'd really recommend uh, taking a look at that. I'll go now through some of the specific features that we did add. Um, keep in mind for the last couple of re releases, again, we, we tried to slow down functionality. What we wanted to do was was introduce tools that really were in high demand um, and that would either uh, support directly the goals of security and uh, performance or that would directly support usability. So one of those that is very important was the auditing. DHS2 has long had auditing, but this was a, a big rewrite of how we handled that, putting all of the detail into a single audit table and being able to make it much more clear and easy to access uh, so that you can have the kinds of logs that you need to be able to do real kind of uh, in-depth and granular kind of auditing performance on what is happening transactionally within your tracker implementation. This was one that uh, came up from very specific use cases uh, in terms of being able to support uh, the kinds of programs that are going on at the clinic level. Um, these Z scores from WHO that cover the weight for age, weight for height, and height for age are complex calculations to do um, and often uh, aren't being used to really monitor growth of a child. Uh, this is something that is an ideal kind of candidate to be just pre-configured into our program rules. And so these were things that we added specifically to be able to improve nutrition and uh, child monitoring programs and ensure that uh, DHS2 is providing analytics that are not just for programmatic decision making, but also are useful for the clinical people that are making uh, personal care decisions. Uh, in addition to this, new uh, information program rules of evaluating for completed dates, um, being able to make sure that those kinds of expressions can be written to show when uh, a specific action has been completed. And as Lars started to show some program rule expression validation. We know that for many of your implementations, you at this point have, have uh, potentially hundreds of program rules. They're quite complex. Uh, we have always had the expression validation for other parts of DHS2, and it was one of the sticking points in Tracker that it was not available for program rules. So now you will get this live validation as you're trying to form your program rule expressions and see if they are uh, able to be calculated, if they've been written correctly. So hopefully this will make it a lot easier to identify when there's a problem with uh, a program rule that you're trying to put in place. Uh, similarly, in the data integrity app, uh, we added in uh, the ability to check for program indicators and uh, program rules uh, so that you can more easily identify those indicators and rules that are causing a problem within your implementation. We have seen, especially when there's a lot of data uh, in a tracker instance, that uh, a simple indicator or expression or a program rule that is not configured correctly can really cause a lot of damage. We are doing our best to make that not the case, but we also are wanting to give you the tools within your own implementations to be able, able to easily identify where the problem might be and then go to work on some fixes for that so that things could work uh, much, much better. In the privacy and uh, security and uh, data integrity kind of categories, uh, it comes also down to deduplication. Um, there's a lot of requests right now for automated deduplication -du tools within DHS2 Tracker. We haven't fully implemented a solution for automating this. What we started with was the ability to be able to mark uh, duplicates. So as you may be familiar with, if you're running Tracker, you know that we have really extensive checks uh, when you're searching for someone uh, and trying to create a new user. So even if you don't uh, intentionally perform a, sort, a search, in the background, as you try to register someone new, Tracker is running a search and is trying to see if you are truly creating a new individual, a new tracked entity, or whether this is somebody that is already previously registered in the system. Um, what we've done is now link that kind of search to the ability to mark uh, a possible duplicate giving you a spot in the data table now where you can see these flags and outside of DHS2 do some kind of merging or cleaning. Uh, some of the challenges associated with this are actually not technology as much as they are kind of uh, processes and work decisions. Merging individual level data is potentially risky um, for quality of care. 
We want to be very confident that uh, before any data ever gets kind of archived or, or removed from a data set, that we are certain that is not uh, data that is necessary for that person's care. Um, so we are working a lot on this. There'll be more design in the future. At the moment, though, your data set already can start to have uh, duplicates flagged for those that uh, the person at the point of care, the one who actually knows these patients, the one who is providing the care, as they see the names pop up, they're likely to be able to provide a good determination that no, actually, these are the same person and to mark those duplicates with a flag. Another uh, requirement for us, again, you may remember that we've done a complete overhaul of relationships in the last couple of years with NDHS2 Tracker. One of the things that we've added now is to create bi-directional relationships. Uh, this lets you choose. You can either have unidirectional or bi-directional, but if it's something like a mother-child, um, it's a great idea to have a bi-directional relationship. This means that whether you are searching and looking through the mother's records or you're looking through the child's, you'd be able to follow that link back to the other. Uh, so that within the system, there's a link going both ways. This is going to help us in the future as we develop more relationship analytical tools to be able to do a lot more interesting kind of analysis uh, due to these bi-directional relationships. Uh, looking at this lovely picture here, you can see recently we had introduced uh, a, a couple of releases ago the ability to add images, um, images as tracked entity attributes or as data elements. Uh, but of course, images are uh, memory intensive. Um, they're often not uh, optimized or the same size between those that are being uploaded. And so we've added the tools within DHS2 to do some automatic uh, sizing and downgrading so that these don't end up taking up your entire uh, memory in your database, uh, allowing for a much more kind of routine experience when it comes to images and the quality and the size that are being stored. Uh, Lars went through some of this again, the ability to uh, assign events to users and then to be able to sort using those assignments. So this is taking us further down the path of having things like uh, action lists or to-do lists so that uh, events can be assigned to an individual user and then they can show up in that user's uh, working list that they can follow. Uh, again, there's more kind of dynamic uh, changes that we will end up making to the working list, but this is already available in the existing tracker. Uh, this one is also the ability to search for relationships the, the user interface, uh, you're able to go and identify where there might be a relationship to one of the patients. And predefined event views, this is again, this in the capture app here. So let me pause a moment and the capture app was introduced uh, a year and a half, two years ago as a starting point uh, covering the event functionalities. So we previously had the event capture app uh, that was for non-longitudinal data and the event capture app really needed to be rewritten anyway. And what we had decided at that time is that the capture app, one unified app for all data entry should really be the goal. Most of the end users that are entering data into DHS2 don't really need to know themselves the difference between tracker, event, or even aggregate. What they know is that they have work processes that require them to enter data, enter data for different health programs, enter data for different reporting periods. And so that work has been ongoing since then. The Capture app started covering all of the event functionality, and we have now been working for the last year or so on getting the tracker functionality into it. It is not ready to be released yet as fully covering, covering the tracker functionality, but that's coming up in the coming months. And meanwhile, when we come across things like the working lists, we've done our best to move all of this new functionality into the Capture app. So I'll, I'll show a few of the things that are coming up in the Capture app, which will automatically be available for Tracker once that is released. So for example, the predefined event views here, this is going to allow us to do the working list much more easily. It would allow you to save a specific view of events, for example. So if you are setting up the program for users, uh, at a certain level, you can make a predefined chart here or a working list that would be shared with everybody the same way that you had done in the past kind of favorites within the analytics apps. Um, and we'll give you a lot more filters that you can use for this so that you could identify, for example, uh, those that would be uh, unavailable or that had missed their appointment or those that needed follow-up visits. 
We've also heard the cries from people that the, the year selector is not so easy. Um, so we did some changes to try to make it a lot easier for people to not have to scroll back year by year or uh, slide through. So now we have a much more uh, kind of functional year selector for dates. And then maybe I'll, I'll close on this one for the capture app. This is one that uh, those of you that are old DHS2 users should uh, be smiling about at the moment. It's always been the case that when you make changes to your metadata in DHS2 that the first step is to clear your cache. And then every time in the future that somebody has some weird performance that we always tell them, clear your, clear your cache, clear your cache. Within the new capture app, uh, we have been able to implement a versioning here so that when the version number is increased in the maintenance app, when any changes are made in the configuration, the capture app itself will detect this and download all of the dependencies, meaning that we shouldn't need to be doing this uh, browser cache cleaning so much. Um, so this will, uh, I think, greatly make the, the uh, performance and experience for the user a uh, much more friendly thing. We won't have to have these kinds of notices going out to the 5,000 tracker users. Everybody tomorrow morning, clear your cache. Um, so this should make a big difference. But again, this is starting right now in the Capture app, um, and we'll be giving you updates in the future about when the Capture app with Tracker will be released. Um, so I would take it to this to say we have a roadmap session that is later in the week on Friday. You'll get to hear much more about the actual roadmap for Tracker in the future. Um, you'll hear it also from Android and analytics and the platform in general. So you'll probably wanna join that roadmap session at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Oslo time on Friday. And then I, I wanted to flag up two things before I uh, opened up for maybe a couple of questions and then turn it over to Martha. But uh, we have a couple of experts lounge sessions that have just been added to the schedule. So for tomorrow afternoon, there will be a program indicators session at 4 p.m. And on Wednesday, there will be a program rules uh, session. And again, these expert lounge sessions are there for you to be able to, to come and ask specific questions, hear from some of the experts uh, behind Tracker to give you some guidance on uh, managing your program indicators and your program rules. So with that, I think I will uh, see if there's anything that we're able to address now just from a questions perspective for a couple minutes. I think we have to switch I mic. I think we're yeah. at, yeah. Just switch right now when we do questions at the end if there's time. Yeah, at the end or in the community or the expert launches. Otherwise, okay. we will not make it to the next session. Great. Then we'll do that. So I will stop sharing All my right. screen and we'll turn it over to Martha. And then meanwhile, I'll also be monitoring the community of practice. We have a couple of others as well. So if you have questions, please put them there as well. So you should be seeing my screen now. Uh, can someone confirm that? Yes, we see it. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone. Um, we are gonna talk now about the DHIS2 Android app. And in this session, we will explore the new features added in the last three versions combined with some uh, demos of the key aspects. But first we wanna talk a bit about the use of the app. What we are seeing here is the Android app adoption evolution as active devices. And as you know, the Android app was released in September 2018. It's a relatively new yet strong component of the DHIS2 platform. The app is the result of a strong effort made by the University of Oslo and donors to be able to reach the last mile for data collection with a full open source and integrated solution. So as we see here, the adoption uh, since its release has done nothing but to grow and we can see only a small decrease early this year. Uh, this is the impact we think of uh, COVID in several projects that had to stop due to the dynamic changing of priorities to respond to the pandemic. In particular that we know of a very very big project in Bangladesh for maternal and child immunization that had to stop and we are happy to know now that it's resuming its, its activities soon. Even with such impact, uh, the decrease is not as steep as it could due to the big number of new devices used also in the response to, to COVID. So we are happy to keep supporting and, and, and helping adopt the, the Android app in the field. So let's talk about the app. Uh, for those new to it, a quick intro, the DHIS 200 Capture app is a native Android application which works on Android still from version 4.4. This could change next year, but for now it is, and is compatible with all supported versions of the HIS2. 
It works fully offline for data entry and integrates the, fee, the three DHIS2 data models, meaning data sets for aggregate, event programs, and tracker programs. The Android app also helps improving quality from the source because it runs your program and validation rules from the data entry moment. Currently, the DHS2 Android Capture app is fully translated to seven languages, including Arabic, which requires right to left display. This is a community effort, just as the DHIS2 web user interface is. So if you are missing any language or your language is not complete, please do not hesitate in joining the community asking for instructions on how to contribute to this. So yeah, let's start with the data sets. Uh, when it comes to aggregate data in the DHIS2 Android Capture app, uh, the form is displayed in a table view. This was already implemented in the early versions of this year. It's not new, but the new feature is the support of the validation rules. Validation rules are useful, as we said before, for checking the integrity of data entered and will show instructions to the user on how to fix the potential errors or inconsistencies. So let's uh, make a quick demo of that. Uh, what we are seeing here is um, we are using a COVID uh, demo instance. So what we are seeing here is three tracker programs and one data set. As you can see, we are trying this to be transparent to the user. For the user, these are activities. So for aggregates, I'm going to open the COVID surveillance. This is a daily surveillance data set, and I'm gonna enter a new record. So let's enter the numbers for yesterday. So this is how the data entry looks like. What you have here are the different sections that you can navigate with the tabs. And then when we are in one particular section, we can scroll the tab. This looks much better, of course, in tablet and in landscape mode. I'm showing it in the most difficult one. We can also adjust the columns just to decide the view that is more comfortable for the user. And then, of course, we can enter values. So let's enter a few. And then let's save. Okay, so it's telling me that I have one error. This is actually one validation rule, which is telling me that there should not be more cases hospi hospitalized than tested. All hospitalizations must be tested. And then the instructions to the users. This is coming from the validation um, rules configuration. So please check the number of cases in the tested and hospitalized table. Okay, so we go here and it's telling us you have two tested, six hospitalized. So let's say, okay, so I want to have 25. Okay, so now everything looks good and yes, I want to complete the data set. So that's the demo for data sets entry and let's keep going um, and go to the data entry for tracker and event program. So in general, the DHIS2 Android app does not require any additional configuration on your DHIS2 server. It will download your metadata for the user logged in, respecting the access and privacy restrictions on your server. It will replicate the data sets, the programs, event and tracker programs configuration, and then allow for mobile data entry collection just by logging in. The data entry flow, uh, the logic for the data entry flow and the messages for decision support or feedback during data entry will be provided by the program rules, just like in the DHIS2 server. So additionally, you can configure your programs for more user-friendly and visual data entry. And to do that, we have different rendering styles that you can configure at program level. For instance, you can render your options in an option set as touch selection images or icons, which is what we are seeing here in the screen. Uh, the assigned icons are selected from the DHIS2 icon library, which currently has more than 300 icons, and it's, gonna, it's been reviewed for, for 235. Another mobile specific rendering type are the QR codes and barcodes. So you can assign uh, this rendering time to a specific, this rendering type to a specific field of type text. The value type has to be text. And then use them for searching just by scanning the code uh, with your phone. We will demo this in a minute. Um, yeah, the, another one, when it comes to option sets or Boolean values, like uh, Boolean value types, like the yes, no, or the yes, only, 
You can select the rendering as either radio buttons or checkboxes in horizontal or vertical display, depending on how many options you have or how long your, op <coughs> Sorry, your options are. And I think the last uh, visual rendering we are presenting are the images. Uh, this will apply for fields with image value type. And the images can be displayed in the tracked entity instance dashboard, in the list of tracked entity instances, and in the map cards that's, that we will see later. The first image attribute that the app finds will be considered the profile pic, and then will be displayed as such, as we can see here. So data synchronization, uh, as we said before, uh, all the app functionality works offline, and data can be synced at different levels. So you can configure for periodic bulk synchronization, either daily, weekly, or monthly, which will be triggered as soon as the app finds internet connection. But the user can also sync a specific program or a specific register form, uh, register from the, from the programs from the user interface. So to do that, they just have to click in the icon, in the gray icon next to the register or the program. It's also available, uh, the synchronization through SMS, which will be enabled when there is no internet connection and the server is configured to support it. There are also new, a new icon sets. So the, um, in the last version of the app, the sets for uh, status icons and sync event status icons and synchronization status uh, have been reviewed. And we have reviewed them uh, to make sure that they all have different shapes and that their differentiation is not based on the, on the color only, as it was before. Yes, and I think we are going to make another little demo for the rendering types. So we are going to work now with the case-based surveillance program. So this is our list of tracked entity instance. Thank you to the volunteers <laughs> for the pictures. So we are going to search. So I can search or I can filter. We will talk about filters later. So we are going to search and we are going to search uh, by scanning a COVID passport that as a sample, we have been borrowed. We have borrowed from his Uganda. Thank you. So we are going to scan a code for this patient. Okay, so here you are. I think you all know her. It's not Juliana. So we open her record. Okay, and then we see, okay, this patient has one clinical examination, which is open. You can see here the icon, and then one lab request, which is also open. So this patient has been started the examination and has been requested a test. So let's open this form. What you are, we are seeing here are the sections. These are the, the different sections that we configure in the data entry form. Here we can see how many fields are completed. And here we can see the completeness for the whole form. So let's process this request and then I have another helper here. <laughs> let's scan our blood sample. Yay. Okay. So this is a barcode render type as the other one was a QR code. Here we have an option set just rendered as a drop down. And um, if it had more than 15 options, I think we will have a search box. So this is the type of specimen we are going to choose. Uh, we, we got the the sample today, we could change to calendar view if that was more comfortable to the user. Okay, and we are sending this to the laboratory today. In the last section, we can see this is a vertical checkbox rendering for a shared option set. So, okay, we want that serology test. Save it. We say it's finished and complete. Okay, so this is what we meant with the icons. Now, now this one is complete. Uh, as you know, I think this is not new. We have another tabs, indicators, relationships, and notes. We will get back to this later. But for now, let's continue with our presentation. Okay. So the filtering. This is not new. As you know, you can filter your data uh, in all screens of the app from the home screen uh, to aggregate data sets or uh, for program data. The filters are adjusted, the, the possibility to filter is adjusted to each domain 
and we have added two new filters in the last version. So currently, you can filter your data by organization unit, by date, either event date or enrollment date, by period, if we're working on, with data sets, uh, by synchronization status, category combination, when it applies, event status, enrollment status, and if the event is assigned to the user. This is a new feature that Lars was introducing before. In the device, we can filter and see what is assigned to me. We will see this a bit later. Sorting is completely new. Sorting is a new functionality that has been added in the last version for tracker and event data. To make it simple, we have integrated it here in the same filter UI, just by adding one icon that the user can click. It will sort ascending or descending as the, as the user keeps clicking. So you can sort currently by event date and enrollment date, <clears throat> and also by organization unit, by the status of the event, or the status of, of the enrollment. So these last ones will be ordered um, alphabetically if the user chooses this. We have also new visualization. This was added in the previous to last version for the uh, events. So what you are seeing in the, in the left is the traditional representation. So we have a list of events, which is mixing all program stages. They are ordered chronologically. So for very long uh, programs, when the enrollment lasts, let's say five, let's say five years, and we have many um, different stages with repeatable events, it can be a bit difficult to navigate. So by opening the menu in the three dots, three vertical dots um, menu in the top right corner, you can choose group events by stage. And then now we're going to have one uh, line for each program stage. And inside, if we click on them, now we have opened the third one, we will see the events that belong to this particular stage ordered chronologically. Um, and moving now to the last block, which are the maps. The map view is not new and is available for event and tracker data. Uh, the map view, you can switch from list view, list of events, list of, list of tracked entity instances to map view by using, again, the three vertical dots. We will demo this uh, in a minute. The maps uh, can display all feature types, so they can display polygons, as you see in the first screenshot on the left, or coordinates in the other two. When we are in the map view, we can still search or filter. We will see this later as well by clicking in the top bar icons. Um, yeah, the, um, the maps can also be explored by swiping the cards. As you see, the cards are new. This is a new uh, feature added from the la in the last version. So you can swipe the cards. It will, be, it will keep navigating uh, your different, in this case, tracked entity instances. And the cards can be opened in case the user needs to see more details of the particular event or tracked entity. And uh, the last, yeah, we are also showing some enrollment important information. Like in this case, we are seeing that this patient has an overdue event from the 14th of October, if that was critical. And there are also new map layers. Um, we already had event layer, tracked entity instance layer, and enrollment coordinates. Uh, but in the last version, we have a bit too new. The satellite view that you can display in any of the visualizations and uh, the relationships layer. This is the most interesting one. You can see it here on the left. So here, for instance, we are seeing one malaria case and the cases uh, to which the case, or to whom the, the case is related and the focus that the case belongs to. We will um, demo this in a minute as well. So let's see it directly, go back. So for this, uh, for this demo, we are going to use the contact registration and follow-up. I'm gonna open the program and we are gonna see the map view at program level. So again, this is our list of um, contacts. And then I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna say show and map. Okay, so these are my cases. And as said before, we can search and we can filter just as we were in the list. So let's, for instance, use, you can see here the available filters. For dates, we usually give some shortcuts, today, yesterday, tomorrow, and all of them. And then the, the user can add also custom dates. 
and then for the status we offer the options and the users have to click on them. I'm going to filter by assigned to me. So I'm a health worker, I want to see what is assigned to me today. Okay, so we see this uh, health worker has two contacts assigned. Uh, we can also display the satellite view in case it helps navigating and we can swipe off of our cards just to to keep opening and we are seeing the navigating sorry and we are seeing here that contact five has an appointment today so i could open and directly okay there is one appointment scheduled for today scheduled for today and is assigned to me so i could open and work on it directly we are not going to do that now because we have seen it already but now let's see how can we use the maps okay let's clean the filters from here so now let's see how can we use um, the maps uh, from the tracked entity instance. So for instance, we go back to the case-based surveillance, our previous user, no, sorry, we were in the contact tracing. I wanna go to contact tracing. So here we have our user. And as we saw before, this patient has a lot of relationships. In this case, the relationships are contacts. So we can display this in the map. So what we are seeing here is that this patient has been in contact with all these other contacts, or not patients yet, and belongs to this health area. So this is what we are seeing in the map. And of course, we can see the satellite. Another interesting use of it would be, for instance, if we go to the community health area program and I say, okay, I'm gonna work today in the Southwest region. So because the patients or contacts are linked as relationships, we can see in the map, okay, who is in my area today? This contact, and then we can open that contact for whatever work we want to do. Something I have not demoed is that we can sync, as we said, either from inside the program or the register. So I can sync from here. Or if I have many records to sync, I can sync from outside. And the experience is very similar to this. Yes. So the last thing I want to explain, and we are changing a bit domains now, is that during summer we released a web app uh, and the role of the web app is called Android Settings Web App is to help manage implementations centrally from the server level. So currently this web app allows you to configure your synchronization settings like how often data is synced in the device, device's data or metadata or the volume of data to download uh, when the users make the first sync. It also allows here in the user sync test, it allows you to make a simulation of the volume of data your user is going to download in the first call. So it can help you adjust your settings, your sync settings to whatever um, network you know your users have. And last but not least, um, the, with this web app, probably the most important thing, you can encrypt the DHIS to local database on the devices. So by selecting the encrypt option here, encrypt device databases in the web app, uh, it will apply to all devices connected to your server. Well, yes. So I just want to leave here this, uh, since the screens, uh, the, the slides will be shared. Here you have links to, um, to the website. And give advice on how to use the app. In the documentation, you find software documentation, but also uh, implementation documentation and MDM documentation. We are doing a strong effort, just like making a strong effort, just like Tracker, on improving the support and documenting it. And then the Android SDK. I don't want to finish the presentation without mentioning that there is an Android SDK. Android is not only the app, but there is also an SDK, which purpose is to fast track your custom DHAs to based Android apps. So there is one session uh, for Android developers on Thursday in the track, uh, in, the, in, the, in the tech track 
on Thursday at 3 p.m. We have also tomorrow uh, the launch experts at 4 p.m. So I already didn't announce it here, but since we will not have questions, time for questions now, I hope you do join us in the wherever launch experts launch. Uh, <laughs> that we will be, it, it will be not only me, but part of the team being there available for your questions. And if not, see you on Friday in the, um, in the roadmap session as Mike introduced. I think, as I said, we don't have time for questions, but we see you in five minutes in the next uh, session, which is about tracker and Android country stories. So we want to hear about real stories from the field and share them with you. And that's all from me, I think. Thank you.